Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Ansley Abraham, director of the SRIB Doctoral Scholars Program, and I'd like to welcome you to our, um, our first um, application webinar. Um, one of the things we, uh, over the years, have, we, what, what we want to do is to make sure we are communicating uh, to those of you who are interested in applying to the program um, better information of how to apply and we thought if we could do it all at once, it would benefit everyone. So that's that's why we're holding this. And thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I have with me on staff today is Monique, Monique Waddell, who is our scholar coordinator. She is the one and know it all about everything we do as a program. Uh, Veronica Johnson, who is our communications officer. And we have a couple of other staff, member, staff members uh, Abby McDaniel and um, and uh, uh, Andrea Kiley, who are also just just starting here and trying to get a feel for what we do and how we do things. So they're they're joining this conversation as well this morning. Um, what we're what the way I would like to do this this morning is hold all your questions to the end. Let us get through the presentation and hold all your questions to the very end. And if you need to write down the, the, um, uh, the PowerPoint slide, the number of the PowerPoint slide that we can refer back to, then just do that and have you can, and, and um, Ms. Waddell and I will answer those questions at the end and we'll have a discussion about anything that um, you need some clarity on. Everybody okay you can with that? And you can put your questions in the chat, but we won't yes, address them you. until the end. And we'll address all your questions and try to um, answer all, 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 the, all the inquiries you have about applying for this program. All right, so very quickly, a couple of things for you to know. Um, this is the Doctoral Scholars Program. It is the, S the Southern Regional Education Board um, program to address um, faculty diversity. SREB is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization headquartered here in Atlanta. Um, if you kind of think about who, who belongs, what, what makes up SREB, it's 16 Southern states. And if you wanna know those states, um, will you go to the next one, please? If you go from the kind of panhandle of Texas, if you drew a line diagonally up to Delaware, the states that would fall neatly, completely under that line are the 16 SREB states. Um, and as you can see from this, uh, from this slide, right now, the highlighted states are of the 16 states. They are the, the nine states that are currently funding scholars in this program. And the states have to be funding you in order to be part of this program. So right now, Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, um, for, um, excuse me, Georgia, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maryland, South Carolina, Virginia, and West Virginia are the current states that are supporting students to be part of our program. All right. So the Doctoral Scholars Program, what is it? What do we do? What are we about? Uh, the program was established in 1993. Uh, the goal of the program is to increase faculty diversity. We operationalize that goal by supporting underrepresented minority students to earn their PhDs. And as they do and engage in that process of earning their PhDs, uh, we provide programming around them that help them get prepared and ready to compete for faculty positions. Um, to date as a program, we've um, supported just over 1,900 underrepresented minority PhD students over or just about, we're just under 1,200, probably in the next two months, we'll be over the 1,200 mark, have already earned their PhDs. They've, they, they, we've had students at just over 100 institutions and in more than 30 states. Now, you just said, well, but you just told us, hey, that you only got nine states that have that are that are that are that have, are committed to the program currently. Sixteen states in your region, but you have thirty states that are produced through because we have students that come through our program who who are in other states and in institutions in other states outside of our sixteen state region. All right. 
So what are the eligibility requirements for being in this program? First and foremost, all of you have to have been admitted into a PhD program. You have to have been admitted. Okay, that is part, that, 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 is, that is number one. You all have to apply to and be admitted by your institutions or several institutions that want you to come to, that inst to, to their institution um, before you can apply to us. You also have to be a U.S. citizen or have, um, have permanent resident states in, um, in, in this country. You may not be employed outside the institution, okay, on a full-time basis. That, that, that especially, yeah, you can't, one of the criteria that we are looking for are students who are committed to and going to school full-time. Everybody got that. You must have earned your baccalaureate or master's degree from an accredited institution. And on, the, on a very personal level, you all must be committed to a career in academia, preferably as faculty, because that's what we prepare you for. That's what this whole program is about, diversifying college faculty. So, you know, we want, because if, you, if you're not committed to that, I mean, this is not gonna be the program for you, quite honestly. Because everything you do, everything we expose you to, every piece of preparation you all will get from us programmatically is to help you be competitive, more attractive, um, better prepared for the for academe, for the professoriate. Um, for a student in our program, you must be enrolled full time. And you must be enrolled full time. And full time, we we do we do recognize that from institution to institution, there are a few differences by and large, but by and large, in most institutions, full time is considered nine hours of of, of PhD study. It's considered full time, and there are, again, there we know we know there are exceptions to that. Um, also, you must be committed. You must, it is a program requirement. You must attend our annual Institute on Teaching and Mentoring. It's our annual get, to, uh, get together. It's our annual meeting of program scholars. It's typically in late October, last two weeks of October, a Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It is a program requirement. If that's something you don't wanna do, you can't do, um, again, this is not the program for you because that is the mechanism in which we, we deliver probably 95% of the programming that we have for you is done through those four days. Uh, and it's an intense four days and you are required to be there. We do not support professional degrees, okay? We do not support professional degrees. That is the DBAs, EDDs, you can see the list of them on the PowerPoint, JDs, PharmDs, you must be applying to be part of this program into a PhD program. Now, we know that there is an exception to this, but it, it, if you're applying to this program for state funds, for state dollars to support you, there are, we will not support professional degrees. It must be the PhD. All right, everybody okay with that? Got that. All right, next slide, please. All right, so all of you, if you've looked at the paperwork, and you know there are two types of awards into our program. We have our, what we call our doctoral award, which is a three to five year package of support, or the dissertation year award. You're, if you're applying to this program, you're applying for one of these awards. The three to five year award, again, you got to be admitted into a PhD program. Go back for just a sec, um, Veronica. Um, you have to, you, you, again, you've got to be admitted into a program, enroll full time. The thing you got to make sure you, depending upon where you are in your, your study, if you are currently a PhD student looking for us for support, we will only take students into this program if they are at the very beginning of their PhD program, we define that as a student who is just started their program up 
to the beginning of their second year. If you are in your second year or beyond, we will, you're not eligible to participate or to receive our award. Okay. And Dr. You're A, I will say this. Can I, can, can I add something? Yes, please. If, please. You, if you are still waiting to hear from your university, we have it set up so that you can go in and apply and put in the cho your, your, your first choice, second cho choice, and third choice. So you can still go and apply if you still haven't been accepted. Um, but it's important that as soon as you're accepted that you alert us because we are not going to have your application reviewed if you have not been accepted or have not notified us that you've been accepted into your institution. And so if you're accepted after March 31st, what you're going to do is you're going to email me and send me your letter of acceptance. Because again, um, we start our review process mid-April. And if, if we have not received your acceptance, then your name does not go forward to our reviewers because you're not in a PhD program. Okay. All right. Thank you, Monique. All right. The second way you will enter this program or the second award that you can get in, in, in through, through the Doctoral Scholars Program is the Dissertation Award. It's a one-year award that is designed to literally help you get over that hump to get that last year of funding in place, allows you all as, as, as PhD students to basically sit, write, get the dissertation done and go on about your business. The students who may apply for that award are students who have, if you will, have reached candidacy. And if you know in the lingo of graduate education, candidacy is defined as students who have finished all of their course requirements, their testing, their comprehensive uh, exam requirements, defend, successfully defended their um, dissertation proposal, then you have officially, quote unquote, reached candidacy. And that is when you can apply for the dissertation award, is when you have reached candidacy, all those other things are out of the way. All right, next, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm gonna add a little bit about that, um, uh, a little bit about the dissertation. So we have made accommodations for you if you have not, um, you know, had your dissertation perspective, uh, perspective uh, prospectus approved. So what we've done is we've put in the contingency that, okay, it hasn't been approved, but you have a date for that perspectives, uh, for that to, to happen. So if you have passed your comps you, and, and, and completed your classes, but you still are pending that, go ahead and put in the date that you have set. If you don't have a set date, that's a little problematic for us because again, you have to have all of this completed before we can make an award. And we're typically making awards in July and August. So you can go in there if you still have that pending. Now, if you haven't finished your courses and you said, oh, well, I'm gonna finish them by July or August, you're really not eligible because there's still other things that have to happen. So uh, make sure that you, know, you can meet all of these deadlines before. If you haven't met the deadlines, you can go in there and apply, but you need to have some dates for things that are happening for us. Okay, so I'm gonna go into documentation. So we're gonna go over proof of citizenship, proof of state residency, uh, transcripts, and your acceptance letter. So for proof of uh, citizenship, everyone has to do that. If you can go to the next slide. So you're, we're asking you to upload documentation. So you wanna upload your birth certificate or your US passport, or your permanent resident ID card. So if you are here on a school visa and you're not going to be a US citizen or a permanent resident, you are not eligible to apply. If you submit your driver's license, that is not adequate proof of your citizenship. That will not suffice. So these are the only acceptable uh, items for you to upload to prove your citizenship. If you can go to the next slide. Now, this one is, is, is a tricky one, the proof of state residency. So if you're in Georgia, Maryland, South Carolina, or Virginia, you've got to prove your state residency. Your state wants to pay for residents of their state. And that's, I mean, that's just the way that it is. In the other states, like Alabama, um, they give preference to Alabama students, but it's not a requirement. 
So how do we determine your state residency? We don't. Your institution does. And we take your institution's word as the law. There's no other way to get around it. You can't send me your, your gas bill, your electric bill. Don't upload that. Sending me your driver's license. Hey, look, I, I have a, a Georgia license. That is not acceptable for you to prove your residency. So you've got to do that through your institution. Now, typically your registrar will do that for you. Sometimes they don't. The good news is most of your um, information is, is available online to you. Um, so you can get your, your unofficial transcript and send that, upload that, which shows your residency. Um, you can uh, use your, your bill from your school. If your school is billing you, they've determined your residency status if you're receiving a bill. So those things you can upload. And if I have questions, I will reach out to you. Now, if you submit your driver's license, basically that's not acceptable. So I will reach out to you. Unfortunately, if I reach out to you and you don't respond to me, then I've got to make that decision on whether I'm going to have your uh, application reviewed because you're not meeting the basic requirements. So do get that in. If I do email you and you've not put in the right information or it's unclear, then you know you cannot, you may not be reviewed. So it's important that you put in this doc the right documentation because you've got to meet the requirements because we have to meet the requirements for our states. Our states are making us uh, responsible for following these rules. This is the, what they've committed to for us to give state monies. We've got to adhere to these rules. And so, so do you. Let me go to the next slide. Okay, so for your acceptance letters, um, you know, make sure that your acceptance letter has a date, make sure it has a signature. Um, because again, we do have that criteria of what you, year you are in your PhD program. And we're looking at that uh, to determine if you're eligible for the, for the uh, award. Um, it, of course, these are unofficial because they are not sent to us. Um, you're uploading an unofficial transcript. Um, uh, you can use that to show that you've been accepted if you've already been in the program for over a year. Um, and you can also uh, send us uh, a letter from your, from your department showing that you've been accepted, that you've gotten this you know, graduate assistantship. There are all kinds of ways that you can prove that. If, if, if you send something and it's questionable, I am going to reach out to you and please do respond in a timely manner. Um, for people who ha have started their PhD program, you've already got a semester under your belt or two. Um, if you want to show those uh, grades and how you've done, then you can upload that information under uh, other graduate studies. So you can upload that if you want to share that information. Go to the next slide. Um, and Dr. A, I'll let you all right, take it so away. Now, um, the thing we need for all of you all to be very attuned to of, of, of what makes a difference in this application process for us, okay? So I'm just, I'm giving you the, the big hints of where you put your energy and your time. Um, in your personal statement, okay, here are the, here are the, you know, it's important because I, I think one of the things all of you need to remember and think about, everybody who applies to this program has been admitted into a PhD program so they are qualified. Everybody is enormously qualified. So what makes a difference? That, that personal statement makes a difference in those letters, uh, your, your, your personal statement letter of interest makes a difference in your recommendation letters way heavily. So your personal statement, no more than two pages. So you, you need to put time and thought into it. Single space, 12 point font. And we are telling you, Grammar and syntax make a difference. Your writing, you know, how you tell your story, how you express yourself makes a difference. So do the best, do the best writing job you can in crafting that statement. Next, next uh, slide, please. Okay, a couple things, you know, a couple helpful hints about that personal statement, that, that letter of interest that we're make it, make it compelling. You know, tell your story. You know, it's personal. It's about you. Share, you know, these are all hints of things to include. What motivates you? Somehow convey passion for your field of study, for the research you're interested in. You know, what's driving you? 
Describe how the SRIB ward will help you. How does it help your community? Tie it into something a little bigger than just you. We know we know our funds help you, but you know you know you're more than just you. You you interact in your community. You have families. You know there there are other ways that this award is also going to help you. Um, describe why teaching is important to you. Why do you want to be? Why do you want to be a college faculty member? Right? Why do you want to be in academia? What can you do with that? Convey your teaching goals. Think about that. Convey your teaching goals for yourself, your students. You know, what are you trying to achieve? You want to be in that classroom? What are you, why, why are you important to be in? Why is it important for you personally to be in that classroom talking to those students? If you've got experiences uh, doing um, teaching assistantships, research assistantships, you know, any kind of graduate assistantship awards and those kind of experiences, you ought to include that in this statement as well. Um, another helpful hint, once you craft this thing, you know, you, and I think probably most of you do these kind of things when you do papers, have another set of eyes look at that letter. Make sure you got somebody else reviewing it for you. Get some help on it. Get some feedback, help, but get feedback on what you said. Just, you know, explain to them what you're trying to say. Did you say it in the way you think? Because in your own mind, you may be there, but when somebody else reads it, if they aren't getting the message, you know, it gives you some, it, it means you need to hone your message even more. So get, get another pair of eyes or several pair of eyes looking at that for you. All right. Next one, please. And I was going to say, often your campus may have writing Ooh, centers yes, that you. can help you as well. Yep. You know, you, yeah, exactly. Um, Monique, for those of you who may already be on a campus, use your campus resources to help you because they are out there. For the dissertation award in particular, you know, we ask you all, if you're applying for one of our awards, um, to do a um, to do an abstract to give us give us an abstract your dissertation topic abstract we're looking for one page or no I said there's no more than one page single space twelve point type that abstract should include you know the problem the description your hypothesis your research methodology um, what are you expecting to get out of it what are you expecting to find we want just a one page summary of of your of that two and three hundred page document you're gonna you're gonna write you got to boil that down and explain to us in one page or two not to us to the reviewers um, what it is that your research is all about uh, uh, is is about okay next one please all right I went just just a couple things about those letters of recommendation remember I told you. These are very, very important. So you want to make sure you all are choosing very carefully and thoughtfully who you ask to write those letters. Remember I said, in terms of academic preparation, all of you are eminently qualified. You've scored well on GREs, you got the right kind of grades. You all are all very intelligent folks. You are eminently qualified and been admitted into a graduate PhD program and an institution. So what people think about you and say about you get to be important factors that we look at. So choose thoughtfully. You should choose someone who knows your, who knows your academic work, like a faculty member, a researcher, uh, a, a principal investigator on a piece of research. If you're not, if you can't do that and you've been working for the last five years, a work supervisor, somebody who knows your work, your work ethic, ethic and can comment on that. A not too good, um, yeah, I'm gonna say, tell you point blank, a not good recommender, a, a letter of recommendation is from a family member, your pastor, a friend. Those, those are not generally looked at very well when compared to people who know the kind of academic acumen you have. 
all right? When you're, just a hint to all of you, um, and I don't know, you know, different, different, different recommenders want different things, but sometimes they want you to write that first letter. They want you to give them a recommendation letter. So, you know, so be prepared to, if, if one of your recommenders wants you to give them a first draft and they'll build something off of that, be prepared to have written your own letter of recommendation. What would you say about yourself? You know, sometimes that's hard to do, but you ought to be prepared. Now, some recommend say, no, nope, I don't want anything from you. I'll do my own, I'll, I'll, I'll take it from the top. But some people do. It helps save them time, energy, effort to see what you'll say about yourself. And they'll, you know, they'll, they'll edit it to their satisfaction and to what they want to say. But it helps sometimes when you all are prepared to have what would you say about you and have that prepared to share with them if they need it. This is a real, make sure when you ask somebody to do a recommendation that you're giving them all the information they need in order to do that. So, you know, to whom, for what reasons, make sure you're giving them every piece of information they need, the address, you know, if it's got to be uploaded, with the, the links, make sure you're giving these folks all that information. If you're asking for it in the email, make sure that all of that information is there. Deadline, deadline, deadline. Um, it's important that you communicate and convey what the deadlines are to those, those people you ask to write those recommendations. It is not in your, it is not to your benefit to just ask, walk away, and assume that everything happens the way it's supposed to happen. You all are typically asking people who are very busy, who have other commitments, and you may not be very high on their priority list. It is, it is incumbent upon you to circle back, follow up, check. Our, our registration system allows you to go in and check those recommendation letters to see if they've come in. You can go there anytime. Because at the end of the day, if they don't, they don't send it in, I mean, we're, gonna, we're not going to look at your application because it's incomplete. And so it is incumbent upon all of you applicants to make sure that things get in. So that's why you see my last follow-up, follow-up, follow-up. Don't just ask, walk away, and assume everything's going to happen. It is your responsibility. This is about you your application and making sure it's complete. Next one, please. And can I also say the good news is that we allow you to have up to five, but we're going to look at the first three. So if you send out your, um, send out your request to five folk, as long as you get three, then we'll go ahead and review your application. Um, so, you know, all five may, and we'll, we'll take the first three um, recommenders, but you can kind of have to give yourself a buffer if you do five, if you have five folk that can do it. But what I will say is make sure there's still five good ones, because if you do one that's not so strong and, and they get theirs in before the others, then we're <laughs> going to look at those first three. Our reviewers are going to look at those first three. All right. And that's, and that's important. And because, and, and Monique is telling you that because, you know, if you got two, you know, you, we, we needed three and you only get two that come through, um, you know, your application, it's incomplete. It doesn't get reviewed and you're out of the, you're out of the, you're out of the running. So it is, again, we're emphasizing to all of you, make sure you follow through, check your, check your application to be sure that those folks have done what you asked them to do. Um, and I also say that um, I get a few folks that call me back. Um, when they're not awarded. And, and you may not be awarded because your application wasn't good. It was just someone had a better application. But one of the strongest reasons is the recommendation letters come in and the reviewers, you know, if, if someone is out of five, if you get a three or a two on one of your recommendation letters, that's bringing your score down. So, uh, if, you know, if, if you're competing with, you know, someone that has a five and then you have a 4.8, your application wasn't a poor application, but someone had a five and they beat you out. So you want to make sure that you have strong recommenders 
And uh, you, like I said, a lot of times that can make a difference in whether you are selected because that ultimately could bring your score down. All right. So kind of things, we're just giving you all hints of, you know, what, what helps your application. Um, we are not telling you by what's saying strong that you have to have a master's degree recipient, but we're just giving you some hints about for us as, re, as a program, if you have the, after, if, if the master's is in place, that's a, that's, that's a, that is a strong element of an application if that is already in place. It, it is not a requirement, but it is, it is an element internally that um, helps you. Um, the strong, uh, Monique just reiterated this point, strong letters of interest, strong letters of recommendation, those things make a difference. If you've, um, you know, if you've had kinds of skills and experiences that you're sharing with us, if you've, if you've published, if you've done research, um, you've done professional presentations, you know, all those things should be part of your, of your application informing us of academic achievement. If you've got experiences at TA, RA, those are things that are about your training and skill sets. Those make a difference. Um, yeah, and those recommendation letters, recommendation letters. Okay, last one for me. Hey, last word I'm, you're gonna get from me. You all would not believe the number of applicants we get each year who never finish their application. Uh, you, you, just, you would be shocked. Um, and I'm telling you, make sure your application is complete because the easiest cut we will make is those who finish their application and those who don't. I mean, that's, it's that simple. So if, 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 this is, if you're serious about this, this is important to you, make sure your application is complete. And I think our, our application system is set up in a way for you to check and make sure all the elements are in there. Just be sure to do that. Because I, I said, you all would be shocked if I told you um, that there, there are more people that don't finish their applications than do. I will just tell you that. So make sure it gets done and, is, and you're, you're doing the follow-up and it's thorough. Uh, don't wait to the last minute and you're scrambling around, stressing yourself out. Um, make sure you're you're working away at it. You got three full months to get all the pieces, and it's not a hard application. A lot of the things we're asking for are things you already have. No, the only you know that written statement is the only, you know, if you will, work you really got to put in in getting uh, in, in terms of that application and creating something. All the rest of it, information you're pulling from here and there and lo uploading it into our system. All right, I'm gonna be quiet at this point and we'll just take and ask, answer some of the questions uh, you have. There, there's some in the chat. Can we start with the ones in the chat? Yeah, that's a good place to start. Okay. Um, um, I had a question from someone, they direct messaged me actually, and they had a question about, well, I can't find the application. And so one of the things that you have to do is take the eligibility quiz. So if you take that eligibility quiz and you're eligible, then it will send you the link to go into the application. If, if it does not send you the link, it will tell you that you're not eligible. So uh, that is the way that you get to the, that is the way that you get to the application. Okay, so and I'm gonna is, start that with- is set, That is set up so it doesn't waste your time because we would hate for any of you filling out an application and you're not eligible. I mean, that, that just wasted your inner time and energy. And, and, and that's, you know, that's not good. We want to right off the bat, <laughs> give you, are you eligible to apply and then apply. And if you, you know, now if there's a question of why you're not, you know, ask that by all means, but that quiz is there to establish your eligibility to apply for this award or these awards. Okay, so we have a question from Ian Houston. Um, and this is about eligibility and employment. Does working in the university system, USG, revoke my eligibility? I am a full-time doctoral student in my first semester. And that also, I also work at a university. 
So I would say this to you. What are you doing at your Ian? I'm going to ask you to talk. What are you doing at your university? Are you teaching? Hi, everybody. So um, I am the Associate Director of Career Development. And in the fall, I teach first year experience. Okay. And so at this point, if you, if USG, that's uh, Georgia, that's Georgia? Yeah, University. Georgia, yeah. Georgia. Okay, so you're already getting tuition coverage, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, so I would say that you're working full-time in a job that you would not be our ideal candidate. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. You, you, you now, yes, Ian, now, now it, it, yours is, it's a tricky situation. This is, and I'm answering just Ian because of that situation he's in. Ian, I would tell you if typically you would not because you're working full time, typically, but because you're in the university system of Georgia, um, let me let me let me get you to do this, Ian. Call me after this, and I'll have a more extended conversation with you a little bit about because uh, 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 there are some st special circumstances that I want to talk specifically to you. About okay. that would not apply to everybody else. Okay, okay. because okay. that's a that's a that's it is it's a nuanced search situation, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about it. Okay. Okay, so um, we have a question from Lydia Meredith. I was admitted August two thousand nineteen. I've completed core course requirements and preparing for my comprehensive exams, working on my reading list, and hoping my reading list is approved by the end of this semester. Am I eligible? Okay, so if you're going into our application system, you need to give us a date when you're gonna be completing this coursework, okay? And I would typically tell you that, you, you know, if, if, if by the end of, let's see, you said I'm finishing. Well, see, so if I- so You're preparing I, for your comprehensive exam, so you won't even have a date. I would tell you that you're really not gonna make the cut because right. really we're gonna start reviewing applications in April, uh, our, well not, our reviewers are. And so if you have not met these benchmarks, then you're really not eligible. Lydia, I mean, so it sounds you're like you're gonna be more eligible. I'm sorry. Because uh -huh. um, people say, well, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, because you still have to get your, your prospectus approved. Now, if you're at a university where this all happens at once, then you have a better chance of having this all done before we go into review. So, you know, you need to have your dates and, um, yeah. you know, just, it oh, just, I've seen so many times where people go in and they take the exams and there's so many things they've got to do to, to get to the point where it's, it's where they pass them that it goes beyond our deadline. So you can go in and, and put in your application, but again, we're going to go with our process. You know, we're not, we're not going to stop our process waiting for you to, to, to get everything passed and, and completed. And Lydia, I would also, I would answer you this way. No, you're not eligible for the doctoral award because you're past, you're, 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 well, you're well into your, probably your third to fourth year. You are eligible. You will be eligible. Prob you're not going to make this year's requirements for the dissertation award. Next year, you will be at that point where you will, have all the things that we need to have done, done so that you can apply for the dissertation year award. You, you know, just given where you are right now, you will not qualify for either doc, the doctoral or the dissertation award. But next year, just given where what you you put in the, in your question of where you are, you will be eligible to apply for the dissertation year um, for twenty three. I think I got my dates right. Yes. Thank you. Uh huh. Uh, Betsy Perez, if I applied before because I was nominated by my professors at my institution last semester, can I reapply? Betsy, you've still got to meet all that criteria. You've got to be within your first year. Um, and, you know, I would also, just as a helpful hint, when you're doing your personal statement, you talk about these professors nominating you. I mean, because that's that's pretty rich that the, the, the someone on your campus has said, hey, we, we think that you should do this. That's something that, that that's a personal interest that you uh, were, were selected or chosen by your professor. So if you still meet our criteria, I say keep reapplying. You know, if you're within that first year, um, go ahead and reapply. Just 
kind of follow up yes. um, kind of uh, somewhere where Ian's question was okay. um, as I I'm a GRA. So that does cover tuition. Right. Would That's okay. That That's good. Out of the eligibility or would I still no, be eligible? No, no, because let me say that this much to you. So another part of you getting an award is that once we've kind of gone through our review process, I still have to contact your institution to see if they'd be willing to cover your tuition. And a lot of time that's through an assistantship, through an, you know, t- teaching assistantship, uh, grad research assistantship, or, a, um, or any other assistantship. So that's typically how institutions kind of work the system. They say, yeah, we'll cover her tuition, but this is how we're going to do it. So that's fine, a GRA is fine. And just make sure that your department is aware. And if it's, if it's outside of your department that they are aware, if it's in your department, they'll know. So, okay, so let's see our um, next see. question. Um, um, Brittany, you ask, um, is there any bit for applying, uh, is there any benefit for applying early um, on the applications? The, really, the, the answer is no. I mean, you could be the first one in there and, and there, there, is, there is no, um, there's no practical advantage to having your, uh, your, um, your application in the first day or the last day. Now, if if you're begging us to get an application after the, after the deadline, that's problematic. I mean, you know, we can say, well, we might let you in, but it it will always be on there that they applied after after the deadline. So you know, it's you know the chances of that um, that happening and you're being awarded uh, slim and none. You know, we you said you got three months to get those applications in. Uh, when it closes, um, that's it, really. Again, we don't we don't review until after that time anyway. So no, there's no um, active benefit for applying earlier versus middle versus late or late in that in that in that period. Emily Vance, are we able to submit CVs with our application? I did not see it listed on the site or app. Emily, are you applying for the doctoral or the dissertation? The doctoral award. Okay, so for our doctoral awards, no, we're not, we're not asking for your CV because typically you're not going to have a lot to put in there. But what, you, what you're going to do is you're going to look at that CV and you're going to weave that information that's pertinent into your personal statement. Okay, so, you know, we have people, I get this question every year by several, well, can I just upload my CV into the personal statement? Let me show you what I've done. And we say no. Now, for our dissertation folk, there's an opportunity because you've 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 done some things. Um, you've been on the campus for a while, and so we have that opportunity. So you, you your your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to take those things that you've accomplished accomplished, and to weave that into your personal statement. If you've gotten awards, if you've published, those are the kinds of things that you weave into your personal statement. And we want to see that you can give us a narrative. Of, of those things that you've accomplished on your CV. Um, and, and Ms. Waddell is giving you a hint at, I mean, your ability to take that information and weave it into your story gives us some, gives us as a program, some sense of your, um, of your writing skills and ability. You know, in writing in, in the graduate, in graduate programs are, are, are important. Your ability to communicate is important. And so we, you know, it's a value. And the, the better you do it, um, you, you increase your chances. Yeah, let's just say it that way. The better you, the better you can tell um, your story, it, it helps you. Um, I see. Um, Roberto. Mike, oh, I'm sorry. Go Roberto, ahead. Uh, if, if you, after this seminar, I want you to succeed. So if you email me and say, oh, Ms. Waddell, I submit it and I get, I get this all the time. People that I, they're, they're really excited to get submitted and they say, oh shoot, I, did, I, I, have a, I worked on my personal statement. If you ask me to open it back up for you, I can do that, no problem. Email me and I will open it up, no problem. Now that's up until the deadline after that, hey, all bets are off. Oh, yeah. But before that, you know, anytime I want you to succeed, I'm not gonna say, oh, we're not doing that. No, if you go in and you submit and you say, oh, I can't do this. I gotta, I gotta update my personal statement. You guys are giving me helpful hints. Um, yeah, just, just email me and I will open it back up to you pronto. Thank you. 
Um, Emily, you asked, uh, or we'll see who is it. I'm sorry, Michael, Michael Fleming. You, you asked, how many fellowships do we give? That's a really good question. Here's the way that works. For those nine states that support our program, there are varying numbers that they support. All right. So, for example, here in Georgia, the state of Georgia supports a total of 20 fellowships per year based on a three year cycle of support. So, kind of just do, you know, divide 20 by three, and you're going to come up with six point something. So what we target in Georgia, there'll be six or seven new awards per year. In um, South Carolina, there are roughly five new awards per year, but it varies. I'm trying to give you an example. Um, give me one who, um, in Kentucky, it's two. I mean, so I'm trying it's to- It's only dissertation, and it's it only dissertation. I'm sorry? And it's only dissertation in Kentucky. Yeah, Cindy, I mean, yeah, there's some other caveats that go with it. But I'm trying to give you all a sense that it varies by state that you're, or institution that you're applying to how many awards there are. And I mean, if you want more detail about it, if you want, if you, if you will, if you want to gauge your chances, um, you, can, you can email us and ask, you know, how many, how many awards are you all going to give in, in um, uh, uh, Louisiana next year, or you know, pick another state that uh, Virginia. How many awards are you going to? You can you can ask and we can tell you. So you can kind of gauge what the numbers are, but it varies by state to give you all overall an overall sense of what we did last year. There were a hundred seven total awards of all the of all the different types that we did last year. Um, I think there were 107 total but some of those awards. Were not not state awards, but total total awards right. with institutions thrown into right. the mix as well. And I will say that you know Georgia and Alabama and South Carolina are really competitive uh, yeah. because you do have a lot of applications from those states. Um, so the, those are the probably the most competitive states. Yeah. And and the um, as Ms. Waddell is indicating the competitiveness of it varies by state because and that's, in Virginia, you're, you're competing about, you're not competing with everybody. You're competing with applicants from a particular state. And Virginia is, is, is really probably one of the most uh, competitive because they make the fewest awards. I mean, they only support six students. Well, seven, six, seven, six seven. Point, so two, six so point two eight. per year. Right. And there's so many institutions. That's why you see a lot of those institutions in Virginia that are partnering. So if you're in an institution in Virginia and you don't get the award, go to your graduate dean and see how you can be a part of the partnership on your campus. So that's uh, Virginia. There's a lot. We have a lot of partners in Virginia, even though it's an eligible. I mean, a part uh, participating state with a lot of eligible institutions. Now I'm going to say this to all of to, you know for all of you who are tuned into this into this call. If you're, if you didn't see your state on there as one of the eligible states, um, all hope is not lost. There may be ways for you to participate in our program. Now we're not going to cover that here because typically we're we're covering for you all those students who apply for state money through our program. But there are some other ways for you to perhaps participate in our program. And when Email you're me. on this call and you're, you didn't see the state that you're applying or the institution in a state that participates in this program, um, you need to um, email, me. email Ms. Waddell or myself after this, and we'll tell you what the deal is and how you might be able to participate in this program. And it would take a lot more explanation, a lot more time. We're not going to spend the time because most of all of you are applying to this program in states who support students in, the, in this program, all right? Um, we had another eligibility question. Okay. Someone is working um, for themselves part-time to supplement their income. And, and I just wanna do this pretty quickly. There is an earning cap. So the, the state gives you $20,000.
You, can, you know, which work. now Dr. A, like he said, there's ways that he works around that in that you can forego your stipend monies, um, but that's not really what our model is. So um, Meredith, if you are working part-time, you know, we'd have to, you know, talk to you about that, but really we have that earning cap and we don't want you to be working outside of the university. Um. So we've got a lot of working people working in the public school system. So yeah. again, I, I say that, you know, that earning cap um, is, is something that we stick to. And so if you're going to forego your stipend monies, um, that's the only way that you would be able to even be considered for an award. And we make exceptions, but that's typically not the rule because we want to help students that don't have this other funding available to get through their PhD program. Yeah, and, and for those of you who got some real special kinds of um, working arrangements, um, I mean, and, and Ms. Waddell is right on the money when she says, we, can get, we give you 20. We allow students whom we award to earn an additional 12 through assistantships, fellowships, or other kinds of awards, uh, all TAs, RAs, you can, you can earn. I'm repeating what she said you can earn an additional $12,000 under our award and get, and get our money. But once it goes beyond that, we will reduce down the amount of awards you get from us to keep it at that earning cap, which right now sits at 32,000. Am I correct on that? Yep, money? it's 32. Mm -hmm. 32, all right. That's the cap in which we allow additional monies to be brought in or be brought to the table. Um, and so typically, if you're working, you're doing other things, um, Davia, I think you're saying I'm working at two institutions. I'm, um, I'm, 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 yeah, I've got some other teaching assistantships. And, you know, the way I would, the way I answer you, we allow $12,000. If those, those other two teaching uh, gigs that you got going are within that, you know, then apply. But if you're making more money, and you say, I, I have to have these jobs, I have to do these things, then this program doesn't fit you. And that's just kind of the way it works out. Okay, Charles. So if you have a defense date in fall 2022, that's okay, you can apply. Because I've had people that have graduated in December. Yeah. So it's okay, you're, you're eligible to apply. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Charles, just make sure that as, as if, if you have not defended, if your dissertation count and you've not defended by the time these applications go in, you better make sure you have communicated to us a definitive, we need a date. If you go, I have no idea when I'm going to defend, I'm going to tell you right now, your application will go to the bottom of the pile. You just, it, it just won't be competitive. We need a set date of when that defense is scheduled. So what I think Ms. Waddell was just saying to you all, we can make an award. Now, we're not going to give you anything until that defense happens. I will tell you that right now. I, can, is he talking about defending? You're, you're talking about graduating, right? Are you talking about your perspectives? I'm sorry. I assume that you were talking about that you would graduate uh, in that semester. I was Charles. trying to. Can you hear me? Yes. yes Charles. I was trying to graduate uh, May 23, but I was trying to defend. Um, in the fall, so right? The, so that we, school year, we consider your graduation when your committee signs off. So if your committee signs off um, and you're not enrolled, I can't pay you. But like I said, if you, that whole semester you would be able to receive funding. So your graduation, when you put on your cap and gown and walk across the stage, we don't care. I mean, we care, we care, but it's not <laughs> what we're counting as your graduation date because. Um, you know, you're, to us, when your committee signs off, that's when you graduated. You are a doctor, you're a PhD. And nine out of 10, um, are you going to be enrolled in January uh, after you have had your committee sign off? Now, if your committee doesn't sign off and you make your defense and you've got to do some more stuff and you're enrolled, you're st hey, you're still doing what the fellowship expects to happen. I mean, we expect these things. That's why we make it a year award. So you're fine. Yeah, you are fine. And I would encourage now, you to apply. Make sure you yeah. figure it out. Now, Terrell, 
um, remember I told you, you're in Alabama, if you're applying to a school in Alabama, they give preference to Alabama residents, but there's not a, there's not the restriction. Georgia, South Carolina, Virginia, um, is it Maryland? I think it's Maryland. Those states require you to be in-state residents. But for like Alabama, it's, it's in Arkansas, West Virginia, it's, it's not as stringent and you will not be disqualified if you do not. And then if you go in the application, it says that. Now I saw in the link that someone says the eligibility, eligibility, eligibility quiz wasn't working. So I'll check that out for you. It should be working because um, I have a, quite a few people that have gotten in um, to it, but I'll check, check for on that after this uh, meeting to make sure there's not any problems with that link. Leah, I, the, the question you posed, I think we may have answered, but I wanna make sure you're clear on how this goes. You ask a question about that, your prospectus defense uh, date, you know, the contingency. Listen, the, the, the earlier, the, bit, the way I would answer you is uh, the earlier you have that defense, the better the better you are in terms of our consideration. And obviously, if you've done that before the application deadline, that's the best. Um, but the sooner you have it, the better. All right, because if, and in all honesty, if that happens before the final decisions are rendered, it puts your application in a better place, in a better position. Because I will tell you all, as we go through this, those students who've got everything in place, those, those students, those applications that have everything in place by the time we're making decisions are, are those that have the best chance, quite honestly. Now we are in uh, those, those where your date is a little bit later, it doesn't take you out of the running, but if somebody's got all their stuff done, you know, we, we, we lean more toward that person's got all their stuff done as opposed to yours, which has a contingency to it. It makes, a, it makes a difference. We have a really good question. How do MA PhD programs fit into the doctoral award? Overall, I'm in my third year of the program, but in my first year of the PhD portion of the program, oh. how does this impact my eligibility? You want me to take it? <laughs> well, I mean, I, either way. Um, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't hurt you as long as you have been quote unquote, admitted into the PhD portion of your program. Yeah, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't impact your, your application at all as long as you're at the PhD level and not, you know, if you will, the beginning master's part of that thing. Okay, it doesn't hurt you at all. Because we have many of the people probably on this call, some of them will be coming in post back learn. They don't have their master's yet. They're, they, if you will, and that typically happens in the STEM disciplines, they, they are admitted straight out of baccalaureate into a PhD program. They will, some of them will get their master's along the way. Some of them it's baccalaureate, next, next stop, PhD. It's just the way some programs operate, but it doesn't hurt you. Thank you. Uh-huh. Okay, I had a question about whether you can work up until the award time, yes. Yes. We don't start counting the, your coins until August 1st, <laughs> and that goes through July 31st. Well, I think this is about the end of our presentation, and I see that we have more questions here, quite a few questions. Um, I, we can, you, we can, um, try to respond to those here, or you can email me and I will be happy to answer your questions. Right. Um, if a few of you who still have, I, I, and I will stay on here a few more minutes uh, so with you and, and answer some questions for you. If you've got a few more minutes, uh, I will do that. Um, um, but, you know, and, and if you got to go, like everybody, we're all busy and got other, other appointments and things to go to, uh, email us. You know, we'll try to answer as many of these questions as we possibly can or, or, you know, email us or call and we'll talk to you, talk you through about your, your particular circumstances and conditions so we can, you know, make sure you, you can get, get in the best application or you can't. 
or that even if we inform you that we don't, you know, don't waste your time because you, you, you're not eligible. You, there's something about your, um, your circumstances that, that renders you ineligible to apply. So you're not wasting your time and energy trying to pull together information or writing things, um, you know, because we're not about trying to uh, waste anybody's time in this process. And this will be recorded. This has been recorded and it will be posted on our website. And for everyone who attended, um, you can also, you'll be able to see the PowerPoint up on the website. Yes. So some of this detail that we kind of went through uh, rather quickly, um, you'll be able to um, access the PowerPoint. And thank you. You guys have been a great- Thank you all. Like I said, for a couple of you, if you got other questions you want, you want to talk to me, I'll, I'll hang around for 10 more minutes or so and answer any questions any of you might have. Be happy to do that. But thank you all very much for um, your interest in applying to these programs. And um, I wish all of you um, the very best in your, um, in your doctoral studies. I, we missed uh, Dr. S yeah. I'll say if, if any of you are still on and you want to ask me a question, just start talking. I'll, I'll you know, we'll, well, I'll answer any questions you might have. Hi, I have a follow-up question to one that was um, asked a couple minutes ago. Yes, um, so I'm in, I have a master's degree in MS from my previous institution, mm -hmm. um, and I'm in my first year at the University of Arkansas. Um, so technically, I'm not going to count my old master's. I'm still going to do another one in the PhD program. So I'm just wondering, am I technically um, eligible after the first year because it's in the master's part of the program? Is it really just that first year of the PhD program where we're eligible? It's first year of your PhD, not the master's, PhD. So even though I'm considered a PhD student, I'd be essentially um, eligible to apply you, after the first two years of the program? Not after the first two years. If you're, if, let's say, if, you, if you're telling me, um, if I understand your question, you've got a master's under your belt right now, right? Yes. You are, you're in a PhD program right now that has a mm, master's requirement attached to it. Exactly. Yeah. The first two years you defend after your second year. Okay. Now answer me this. What were you admitted to a master's program or a PhD program? A or PhD. PhD. Okay. All right. So if you were admitted to a PhD program, so even though you're going to get that, you, you know, the first two years of that math, you're going to get the master's along the way. We are counting that as a PhD enrollment because that's gotcha. what you're admitted into is a PhD program. Okay, gotcha. That makes sense. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, no, that's not, that's, a, that's a great question. It's a great question, and it's it, it, it indicates some of the nuances of this that you know it's hard to convey. And you're that's a that's a great question. For sure. Thank you so much um, uh -huh. for your guys' time. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Anybody else got anything that they are questioning? Want to know more about? Want to get additional? Info, information, questions? I just had Leo? a quick question about the um, October meeting. Where, where is that usually taking place at? It's going to be in Atlanta at the Marquis, Marriott Marquis. And the dates, I don't have exactly. It's uh, the last it meeting is, of October. Uh, October 27 through 30. And it's here in Atlanta. Thank you. Uh-huh. I will say, um, if you all follow us on our social media pages, a lot of times we are sharing that information on the dates of different things that we have coming up, whether that's a webinar or other programming and the Institute information as well. And I've included that information in the chat. Thank you. All right, everybody else, good? I do have a very quick question. Just wanted sure, to Meredith, Meredith. Thank you so much, Mr. Um, Abraham. So my question is twofold. Um, one year, first year doctoral program students, that would mean like if I enrolled in August, my eligibility ends as of this current year, correct? If I enrolled in my doctoral program in August of 2021, this is my only opportunity to apply? That would yes. be correct. Okay. That is correct. Now, you know, so you said it is your only opportunity to apply, apply to the doctoral award Let's say you, you, you missed this one or didn't get this one, 
you would still be eligible to apply for the dissertation award when you get to that point. Got it. And then just one more um, sure. question regarding the annual Institute on Teaching and Mentoring. Did I hear you correctly when you said that it's the last two weeks in August of 2022? It is It is usually within that last two week period. It's, it's, um, I, it's, it's rare that it's not within the last two weeks of October. Okay, and does it run full days or did you say weekends? It runs from a Thursday to Sunday. Thank you, sir. Yeah, it's coming in, coming in late on Thursday, leaving midday on Sunday. And it's a extraordinary event. I will just say that. And I'm not just patting ourselves on the back. It's pretty extraordinary to... Um, be in a meeting in a room where you have um, well over a thousand or close to a thousand minority PhD students who are literally from all over the United States, all pursuing PhDs. It is, it is the largest gathering of minority PhD students in the country. It's, it's, it's incredibly powerful experience, motivating, um, yeah, and I hope you get it, and I hope you get have the opportunity to see it in action. It's an incredible experience. All right, everybody good? Hey, everybody else, everybody good? Meredith? How you doing, sir? Good. Everybody yeah. good? Yes. Anika, I have a, good? Everybody I have all a, right? I have a question. Yeah, yes. Um, I know that was supposed to be 11 o'clock, 11 a.m. meeting, but I got on and you all were already having a meeting. So is this a past meeting or is there still going to be another 11 a.m. meeting? This is 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Are you in a different time zone? Because right now it's it's 12.15 here. Oh, so yeah, um, it's 11.15 a.m. here. Yeah, we're all of our meetings. We are in Georgia, so all of our meetings typically are Eastern Standard Time. Okay, I didn't know that. I didn't yes. have a clue. I do apologize. Um, right. But Alika, we I mean, we did record it, so I mean, we okay. you can you will be able to go back and hear the whole conversation. Great, great. Not a okay. problem. Yep, not great. a problem. Okay. In, in addition, you also have access to the PowerPoint that we had up there, so you you know you got. You can have that to follow along with it. Yes, great. Would that be emailed to me or do I have to access it from the website? We're going to email it to all of our registrants and it will be accessible on the website as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And once I review everything, if I have any questions, I'll just email you all. Absolutely. Thank you, yes. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Okay, everybody. We appreciate everybody's time and uh, questions and good luck on this. And we look forward to getting all of your applications, completed applications. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.